Uh, my name is Honey Kwon. I'm Senior Research Fellow of Social Anthropology at Trinity College, Cambridge. And my, the topic of my talk today was about North Korea. And uh, the title I was given is about isolation, the country's isolation. And I tried my best to explain where this isolation from international society uh, possibly comes from. And uh, I hope the lecture made sense to some people. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. G good evening and welcome to another Darwin College lecture in a series which, as you know, the theme is isolation. Today, we turn uh, to the topic of political and diplomatic isolation, if you like. The trauma felt, as many of us know, following the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transition of China towards a global economy has arguably left North Korea without friends that can be relied upon. Furthermore, whilst there is a cessation of hostilities between North and South Korea, there is no formal end to the Korean Civil War. It's not surprising then that the leadership of North Korea do feel somewhat insecure. And the leaders of that country focus on strength, drawing no distinction between the ruling party and the military. The population has therefore, to some extent, been cocooned into an illusion of paradise on earth by a self-imposed isolation. And that isolation requires the leadership to be elevated into a sort of supreme status that requires unquestionable reverence. Of course, the isolation of North Korea cannot be discussed without a deep understanding, which I certainly don't claim to have, of the colonization by Japan, the interventions that led to its division, and the civil war that followed, where, as you will know, there was an explicit threat made for the use of nuclear weapons. So the story is a very complex one, and not amenable to armchair politics, despite the fact that I'm sure there's much of it around. But of course, our speaker today is a master of this subject and not an armchair politician. So Honik Kwon is a professor in the Department of Social Anthropology here at the University of Cambridge and a senior research fellow at Trinity College. Last year, he was elected as a fellow of the British Academy in recognition of his outstanding work on the post-colonial Cold War civil war memories in Vietnam and Korea, death rituals and the politics of kinship, and many other subjects. Professor Kwon is currently engaged in a five-year international research project entitled Beyond the Korean War, funded by the Korean Sciences Academy. And today, he will focus, as you all know, on the subject of self-imposed isolation in North Korea. So please join me in saying a very warm welcome to Professor Kwon to deliver his lecture. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for coming up, turning up in this reasonably dry weather. And, and uh, I'm afraid Master has said it all, and I don't, I don't have much to say anymore. <laughs> but I'll try my best to add a few things. Um, it's a great honor uh, to be part of this lecture series and uh, meet you face to face, many students, uh, eminent colleagues, and people from the local community. It's a great occasion that we are all together. And on the, I'll stick to this. I will I'll present a case, an, an understanding of an important uh, political entity 
in a very important region of today's world uh, as a, not on its own, but as a case to think about the uh, overarching theme, which is isolation, right? And uh, during the interview, I think I mentioned something like, I'm an anthropologist by trade, and I stick with, I stick to classical anthropology, if you like. So, the, so I still believe we can gain much of uh, the knowledge of the world by isolating us, ourselves. You know, anthropologists usually in British tradition especially, we go somewhere uh, exotic and you're totally isolated. But are you? But you're surrounded by other people, but you, you think you're isolated. You slowly get into the local community and receiving the hospitality from the local people and you feel, oh, you, you are no longer isolated. But take, that takes a long time. But the acquisition or pursuit of knowledge starts with isolation. So after this lecture, presumably we'll have a reception and some of you go out for a meal and after the heat of so, uh, so, sociability and it is the great tradition of this country that I can retreat my own corner and read a good book, right? So isolation is part of our life. But in today's talk is uh, preparing for the following lecture next week, uh, we expand our horizon into international society. So as individuals within a particular society um, shift between thick sociability and self-induced, self-conscious isolation. So to keep the balance between the two is important, I suppose. But in, uh, just as we do, the states in the modern world, many states are extremely ego-centered animals, some more than the others. And some claim that most states, state by nature, are self-centered. Maybe there is a truth to it. But in modern world, the state, however ego-centered they are, have to associate with each other. That's how we live. So that we have, that's why we have something called international society. As we have society or community of Cambridge. Right? So, the, but some state, even in the modern world, uh, in in the language of international politics studies uh, are more prone to isolationism than the others. And uh, as Master has said, uh, possibly, although North Korea is not alone in this matter, it is one political society that goes somewhat extreme on this matter. So the question is, why it goes to an extreme degree on isolating itself. But mind you, that all states and nations can be interested in isolating themselves. We can think of many examples. I wouldn't mention it because it's so hot. Um, so where is a community, you isolate yourself. Why would certain people do that? That's a big question. So, I have my opinion, but I wouldn't say that. So North Korea is not alone, but it is extreme. So that's the first question. And then the first question would be, why, where does this extremity originate? What is the background for its isolationist behavior, if we can call it isolationist behavior? The second question is, is it, as the title of this talk suggests, self-willed or self-induced, or uh, on the contrary, it is enforced on them. It doesn't want to isolate itself, but the international society or the powers that be make that particular society isolated for certain reasons, for moral or political or other reasons, geopolitical reasons. So that's the second question. Is it their making or someone else's making? That's the second question. 
And third, really big question is, if it is isolated as it is indeed, what can we do to bring it back to international society? Some social milieu within which people can speak to each other and argue, argue with each other if necessary without resorting to um, violent means. So there are three questions. The last question is most important, but I don't think I'm capable of uh, engaging with it thoroughly. So I will uh, allow me, if you allow me, I'll focus on the first two questions. A very, very brief, extremely skeletal history. Um, um, but Master has already mentioned, but I prepared it, so I'll go over it anyway. So, so 1945 is a very important year uh, for most European countries and most countries in Asia and Africa, uh, not to mention Latin America. 1945, the end of the Second World War. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, the, but for, for Korean Peninsula, 1950 is also import, was an important year. Uh, as uh, Master mentioned, it underwent one of the most brutal and long-lasting civil war and civil and international war because uh, the, the Korean War was um, by far of all the wars people fought in the 20th century was most international war. The United Nations took part and 60,000 British soldiers, many Scottish and Irish soldiers, uh, lost their lives in this conflict. Not to mention, you know, the, uh, the Koreans, combatants and civilians. But equally important is what we remember as the end of the Cold War. Without the end of the Cold War, say 1989 to 1991, 89, the Berlin Wall, you remember, November? It was a moment in history, wasn't it? I was in the uh, very remote part of then Soviet Russia in Siberia, in an island called Sakhalin, and then I had no idea what was happening in Berlin, but uh, my case officer, Sergei, who was a KGB officer, came to see me, to talk to me about what was happening in Berlin, which I had no idea of. So we had a long talk. I don't think we slept that night. And, and then later on, uh, like most former KGB officers, um, oh, I'll stop there. He, he did well afterwards. Anyway, 89, 91, the end of the Cold War. So when the world is, with, when the, if the world is divided into two and you have a friendship and enmity, you have friends and who share the same enmity, that you live in that milieu. But when that, that structure breaks down suddenly, what happens to you in your uh, engagement with what we call international society? When there is no longer at the border, what do we do? Um, and when your old friends suddenly give up on you, economically and politically, where do you find new friends? Or do you stop looking for new friends and do something else? That, that's the question that was vital in the beginning of 1990s and up to the present for North Korean state. But as Master briefly mentioned, the experience of colonialism, like, you know, it is, we can go a long way in, in trying to understand the predicament of North Korean politics to 1945 and 1991 or 1989, but we can go a bit further to 1910. The Korea is unique, together with Taiwan, um, by being colonized not by Western Empire, European empires, but aspiring Asian empire. So that makes huge difference. We, we, uh, 
I mean, it, 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 the, I, I, the, those of you who, uh, who specialize in global history may contest empires and empires, but the, the, the imperial uh, colonial history in Asia, expansion of Japan from nine, late 19th century till the 1945 is a very unique phenomenon. So we can, we can go a bit further than 1945 in trying to, while trying to understand uh, the predicament uh, the, or what some, some people call the North Korean enigma. Why, where this propensity to, uh, propensity for isolationism originates. But today, um, I will skip the 1910 and 1945, the colonial experience. I'll just focus on 1945 onwards. So in 1945, when the Pacific War, the Asian part of the Second World War, remember, the Second World War was not necessarily a European war. It had a two-pronged, it was a two-pronged war. Only the United States fought in two spheres, two, two battlefields, Asia and Europe. So the, so with the end of the Pacific War, the, un, like some other nations, like Palestine and elsewhere, the, this, particular, uh, this particular society or particular land uh, was partitioned by the Soviet armed forces in the north, north of 38th parallel, and south of that parallel, the American um, uh, built military government. So for two to three years, the Korean, there was no Korean government, it was a Soviet military government and American military government. Obviously, it's natural that if you're Americans, you try to bring American political system into this, you know, kind of newly liberated place, and the same goes to the Soviets. And so things started go, uh, going wrong from, let's say, as soon as the Pacific War was over, and the Cold War, as we know it, before, I mean, a, apart from Greece, before Cold War began to be felt as a real thing in this country and other European countries, Koreans start feeling the impact, the heat of, the heat, real heat, not cold at all, the heat of the bipolar world order. Um, as soon as it was liberated from Japanese military and colonial occupation. And then during the interview, uh, uh, Janet uh, kindly asked me about my personal history and then um, my, I have several uncles. My father has 11 children, you know, old days. Uh, no, 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 my grandfather had 11 children and, and he sold all the land and sent, sent over some of his uh, children as well as nephews and of a couple of nieces to Japan to study. Uh, and then they all came back as communists. And it had a lot to do with 1917 Russian Revolution. I'm not going to get into that. But, and then some of them moved to the north after 1946 and 47. That's, it's, it's, every, it's many families' history. So we don't talk about these uncles and aunties. And as a child, you get, you get interested. What, you know, who are these people in these faded pictures? Uh, no, don't ask about them. And, so, and then, because you're asked not to ask about them, you're more curious about them, right? <laughs> and so perhaps my anthropology career started then, and unlike some of my uh, esteemed colleagues, Caroline Humphrey is there, my, my first um, take my first curiosity about anthropology was not about Europe and the rest, but it's about North and South, if you like. Or if I was born in Berlin, you know, what happened? You know, how do people live in Eastern side of this city? And that was my anthropology question. So the country was divided. And then 
the, the, the Americans and Soviets established, you know, they're kind of, it's not, they're not puppet at all, but they're, you know, some kind of regimes to their liking. And then it was supposed to be Cold War, but because of colonial history, the local actors of the Cold War in that part of the world wanted to get the nationhood right. How do you get nationhood right? Get rid of all the others who think otherwise. So if you, uh, if you, if you think you represent the desire and aspiration of the nation as such, you are the one who has the mandate for the entirety of the peninsula. That's how the civil war took place, which soon became international war. And the, I will mention this fact, why, and the master said, mentioned that it is, the relevance of this war is, is still very reverberating in the today's world. And remember, it's not the Soviet, it's Soviets who established the northern regime. But it's not the Soviet who took part in Korean War as an international force. It was the Chinese who took part in this war, the international war part of the Korean War, right? And Brits, Americans, Australians, Thai, Filipinos, and Ethiopians, and Colombians, you know, like a broad American sphere, I'm sorry to say that, broad American sphere, the nations took part in this war of, in support of the South. So some argue, my, some of my eminent historian, histori you know, historian colleagues argue in this country as well as in the United States and a few in China that the China's rise to great power started with Korean War, 1950, October 1950. So it joined in the Korean War in place of, despite the fact the Soviet Union was not, you know, major fighting force, and it gained enormous authority in the, world, in the Cold War era called the Second World War, Second World, in the Socialist Revolutionary World, as a beacon of great revolutionary power, and as well as in the rising Third World, right? So the, the, the struggle between the two sons in the Second World, two powers, some call it two sons, you know, how can you live with two sons? It's not possible. So two powers started in the field of Korean War or during the time of the Korean War that was manifested radically, to be manifested radically from 1959 onwards, what uh, historians call Sino-Soviet conflict. Now it is different time again, but the, the, the trouble of the troublesome great power in that part of the world, great Eurasian part of the world, and we the focus on East Asia started beginning with the Korean War. I think there is some truth to it. So that's the relevance of 1950. And North Korea is very well conscious of that. So 1989 and 1991, some, uh, a great state leader of today's world uh, who is very troublesome, I wouldn't mention who it is, once said that the end of the Cold War is the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. I don't know whether we, how we can make, make sense of that because the end of the Cold War was a good thing. You know, if you ever, those of you who visited Berlin, it's, it, was, it was fabulous, this, you know, spectacular thing. And then the life without this Iron Curtain is a good thing. But for some people, it, the end of the Cold War, what happened in Soviet Russia and Eastern Europe and elsewhere in the Second World War, a Second World was a devastating event the most tragic event of modern history, something that should never be repeated. 
And some people think that. And North Korea is not alone because it really did undergo the end of the Cold War and the ensuing era with great pain. And North Korea, the founding leader Kim Il-sung, and um, passed away in 1993. So it was a double crisis. So the allies are gone. No more friends. So it's the, the country feels totally isolated. And it, either, it had a choice. Either you break down this relationship of enmity with the other side, as the European, many Europeans did, okay? Or you find another way. Where is the other way? There is no other way. So it closed its border. And when the founding leader, who was a very um, charismatic figure, charismatic um, in all senses of the world, of the world, and it, because his charismatic politics was trademark in some ways, it was a necessary political form in revolutionary politics of 20th century. You know, we remember in China up till 1960s, uh, in Soviet Russia, up till mid 1950s, there were hugely charismatic figures, right? But outside world may not think so, but within the given political society, they were hugely, almost kind of transcendental figure. So North Korea, there was nothing, nothing wrong with North Korea pursuing its own form of charismatic politics. And then that persona was the founding leader, Kim Il-sung. He passed away in 1993. And the gentleman in front of his, uh, Kim Il-sung's statue is his eldest son, Kim Jong-il, and embracing uh, the people. And it's a great crisis, both economic and humanitarian. And the death of Kim Il-sung and the end of the Cold War brought North Korea to self-isolation, closing the border, and as you know, experts estimate uh, at least about half a million and up to more than one million people died of starvation and other related uh, predicaments. So it, it is an episode, this, the end of the Cold War is an episode that is remembered probably differently between the elite and the uh, um, general population, but as a tragic, tragic moment and never to be repeated. So that is one thing. So North Korea is nothing exceptional in, in 20th century politics. There is, there is nothing exceptional about North Korea. But what is, uh, what is distinct of uh, North Korean way of doing politics is, as I will explain a bit later by making reference to um, a bit of social science literature, Max Weber especially, is this the, the continuity of charismatic politics. Continuity of the founding leaders' uh, huge legacy into, um, into a legacy to be, you know, legacy to be cherished and kept uh, even after his death. That didn't happen in North Korea's close allies, bigger brothers, remember 1950s Soviet Russia and, you know, 1970s or late 1960s, 70s China. No, it when that person, the persona, goes away, uh, something happens, either politics goes more institutional or there, is, uh, there has to be some reflection on the use and abuse of personality cult. But that didn't happen in North Korea. So it, within the given international system or international community of the second world, 
North Korea is unique. If there is something called North Korean exceptionalism, is this propensity to perpetuate the founding great leader's charismatic authority beyond his life. That's, that, that defines North Korea in many ways. And it says so. The North Korea itself, the state, says so. And to our mind, to our, you know, there are too, sometimes there are too many news in the media, but what is most familiar with us uh, in relation to North Korea is this military buildup. It's a declaration last year of we are, we are fine at, at last a nuclear armed state. So you recognize us as a nuclear armed state. So we will associate with you if you recognize us as such or we don't relate to you if you don't. So that's, 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 what is, that's the image that is most familiar to us. And it's a contradictory image because I mentioned the economic collapse after the collapse of Soviet empire and how a weak and poor, um, a weak state and very poor society can achieve something that only the great powers of modern history, modern historical development have achieved, except a few, apart from a few exceptions. There are exceptions, right? And so this, this, is, this, is, this is enigma, you know, the, what a colleague of mine in the U.S. once called in his, as a book, as a title of his book, the tyranny of the weak. How the weak uh, blindly pursue the facade of great power by whatever means, right? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying this uh, as a, as a, as as a, as my own statement. I'm just representing the general view to North Korea's um, uh, art of politics as we know it in today's term, right? And so as I said, you know, it's a economically devastated and undergoing, has undergone continuous uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, there are reports this year, again, there are a uh, considerable food shortage crisis in North Korea in part uh, due to the COVID restrictions and which closed the border between China and North Korea. And so the, there, is a, there is a crisis building up within the society and the state is quietly acknowledging it, but it, 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 does, it doesn't know yet what to do to, um, to avert the crisis um, and it has sent messages for, you know, uh, appeal for help, assistance to different international organizations, but because of the sanction regime, you know, there is the, you know, North Korea is sanctioned by United Nations, uh, it's difficult for um, other states and international, insti international organizations to uh, provide um, e you know, what North Korean society needs at the moment. But despite this economic meltdown, <clears throat> it has uh, repeatedly claimed that if you think, if you think we're gonna, let, let's deal with, so it's a direct translation is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a quite popular adage that means don't ever wish for me changing. I'm not going to change. But this is not the, it, this doesn't mean that it's not going to change. It has to change. But what it means is it's not, we are not going to change according to your dictate. So you is, who is this you is another thing. But it's, uh, uh, 
It can be sometimes outside world. It can be of the southern antagonist, South Korea, uh, and mostly, most often, is American power. So it is, I'm not going to change according to your dictate as some European former Eastern Bloc countries have done. So something like that, right? Or it can mean, it can point to China as well. So China has, I think, with great sincerity, has tried to push North Korea to change according to Chinese model, right? But when China the, sees this message, it, is, it means that I'm not going to change according to your own dictate. The economy first socialism is utterly wrong. It is a betrayal of the principles of socialist revolution. So I'm not going to do economy first socialism. I'm going to do something else. And later on, I'll introduce it, this very powerful concept. It's a military first politics or military first socialism based on the understanding, among other things, that the collapse of Soviet power was uh, due to the alienation of Soviet army from the Communist Party. So the army and the party internal alliance is the backbone of Soviet power, and something happened, and it collapsed. And we are not going to do that. And there are other things. So depending on how, who sees this message, the meaning can be different. We are, not going to, we are not going to open the border, and we are not going to invite investors. We are not going to open our borders to humanitarian assistance if the humanitarian assess, assistance is tacked on, um, on verification of the food distribu dis distribution, and etc. And if, if it goes to, if, if, uh, if people in Peking sees it, it, see it, and it means that, you know, we are different. We may c consider you as the greatest and closest friend from time to time, but don't ever forget, we are different. So there are a lot of messages. So it is a great, great message. You know, it, it says a lot, but it, 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 it says a lot, so it, 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 it's too much in it, but it is, as a message, is a clear message. I'll skip the other part. So just again, before getting into the, the, the social science bit about charismatic power, which is helpful for uh, understanding uh, political forms such as North Korea's. Just, just uh, add a note on the historical particularity, historical, historical particularity of North Korea's isolationism as we see it in today's world. North Korea was not isolated before. It was far more open than southern antagonists. It was more open, probably, uh, than most other newly independent uh, states, at least in Asia, in the later part of 1950s and 60s. And economy was doing very well. So once North Korea was considered among many of its uh, friends and admirers in Africa and elsewhere, in Asia and elsewhere, as the beacon of, there is a scholar, young scholar who studies East Asian economic development. Yeah. And North Korea used to be known, at least in the 60s, as the beacon of post-colonial economic development. Zimbabwe thought so, Tanzania thought so, Bangladesh thought so, and it, the North Korea was very self-conscious of its heroic status in the 1960s. And that's how, in part, how it, uh, it pursued vigorously its diplomatic ties with the global south. 
Remember the non-aligned movement and things like that? The third world as such. So North Korea was possibly more active than China in the third world diplomacy, at least in the 60s. And South Korea was far behind it and trying to catch up, but no way. But North Korea had revolutionary credentials, independence, you know, revolutionary war, and national unification, and economic powerhouse as a small, weak post-colonial state, and who has the guts to say to former masters, no, we are equal to you. So people loved it. And some of my colleagues, in the United States, like Columbia University, I wouldn't name who it is, was once very much involved in this. He is a very eminent historian, and he was young uh, chairman of, he was long chairman of Young North Korean Friendship Society in Uganda before he turned into a fabulous uh, scholar of global history in Columbia University. Bakhmut Mambani, right? And so these, the, these histories are there. I mean, if you go to uh, Zimbabwe and Tanzania and Zambia, the traces are still there. So in the mid 20th century, North Korea was such an open country in diplomatic terrain and something happened. And then that something is in, in principle, is the end of the Cold War, but also to do with the pursuit of a particular mode of succession of power, unlike uh, its uh, bigger socialist brothers. Two things. Okay. So the, because of this experience in the 1960s and 70s, uh, what we call third world movement, North Korea has built up, built this strong uh, sense of, of <clears throat> North Korea as global power. But it is not global military power, but global revolutionary power. And why is it necessary? And because it was doing well, but at the same time, the succession of power along the family line was already in motion in the 1970s. So this this inheritance of political power from the founding leader to his eldest son was already settled by 1970s. So if you want to be, if you want to be a leader in this small as it may be, you know, globally eminent, you know, authoritative revolutionary power, you can't be a leader of a small nation. You have to be a global leader on par with Stalin or Mao Zedong. So that was very much part of this uh, uh, North Korean um, political development from 1970s onwards before the founding leader passed away in 1993. So North Korean leader is, leader of North Korea is by definition a global leader. We can't call Kim Il-sung a leader of North Korea. No, he doesn't want that. He, what he wants is a leader of global revolutionary movement. And that inherits to uh, the following generations. And I don't think it's lost at all. So it is one important element of knowing North Korea, at the, you know, let alone Forget how this came about. You know, why this, you know, megalomania, you know, the explosion of ego, and you are a leader of poor, small country, but why do you claim to be a global leader? We can think that, but it has a historical background, only through which, something like only through which you can actually build up the political system and the political security and etc. So that's the, we, some people, on this point, the 1910 and 1945 
may come as a meaningful uh, historical experience, because I'm not going to get into it, but some colleagues of mine think that this is something in the line of uh, the ghosts of imperial politics. So those who un suffered under imperial politics, somehow they they think they are liberated and they are, you know, self-determining, but the way in which this politics of self-determination, a radical form, works, comes dangerously close to imperial politics or something. There are colleagues who argue that. So the, the, the experience of Japanese colonial and imperial politics um, by the Koreans is still vivid and alive in kind of in mysterious and curious ways. I'm not sure whether I share the view, and uh, because for because I, you know, I, I, I mind you that the book I'm best known for is about ghosts. It's called Ghosts of Vietnam War. Ghosts of War in Vietnam. So I'm considered some kind of some specialist on phantom phenomenon. But you know, I, I have no. But it's a, the phantom phenomenon I deal with is very ethnographic and empirical, like a haunted house, real haunted houses, not this haunting in historical metaphor. So I have no means to say to clearly uh, my opinion on this matter. So apologies. Skip that. Skip that. <clears throat> so, I'll go very briefly into the conceptual bit because we need we. This lecture is done in collaboration with Darwin College, Eminent College, and here is a, a, it's it's a scholarly institutions, and I happen to be a social scientist, and then I'm bent on empowering social science in Cambridge, particularly anthropology. And uh, Max Weber is, is a hero of my work on North Korea. I couldn't have written that book without him. And in, put it in utterly blunt way, North Korea is totally anti-Weberian. In the sense, screw you, Weber. We're going to go beyond you. What Weber said is an eminent German historical sociologist or philosopher. You know, at the turn of the 20th century. Unique, because anthropologists read it, sociologists read it, historians of religion, particularly those who study Reformation period, are a read reader, at least some of them, of Max Weber. Max Weber has huge corpus of work, but one key work that I uh, introduce to you is his work on charismatic power. So according to him, there are three kinds of, he was brilliant in typology. And social science is nothing but typology. So it, it is three forms of authority or power. One is traditional, very familiar to us. The king is dead. Long live the king is a traditional power. And on, on, on the feast dinner, we cheer to the health of used to be to the queen, but now it's different. But it's, you know, to my queen or to my king. That is traditional power. No matter how things change, tradition is important. And in this country and elsewhere. So traditional power, emperor or patriarch in all things, right? How can you talk back against your father? Or some stuff like that. So that's a traditional power. It's a time-tested, you know, feudal or otherwise, time-tested, you know, form of power. And second is different. It's like, you know, what we do every day, except during the feast or in, you know, extraordinary occasions. It's like paying the bill for Scottish power and things like that. You know, um, Barclay Bank, you know, threatening letters. That, uh, and so it's a rational, the power of rational order, rational power. So it's a life is, life is instituted in kind of complex myriad of legal, 
you know, legal orders. And then in, in anthropology, we used to study rituals because rituals is what is most important in tribal politics, but we don't have that. We don't do rituals anymore. And we do that only in traditional form, but in everyday life, we don't do rituals. We live in the matrix of legal order. That's a rational power. So it is good for us, he says. It is all you know, sensible and rational. But Marx Weber thought, I mean, the tongue in the cheek, okay, we create this modern bureaucracy and modern state based on huge bureaucracy. European Union, huge bureaucracy. I don't know which is bigger, but it's a huge bureaucracy, bureaucracy. And okay, we created that in order to liberate ourselves from the greed of traditional power, especially patriarchal, you know, undemocratic, you know, like monarchical, well, parliamentary democracy. But mind you, look, watch out. So you create this legal order, bureaucracy, but it becomes a case for you. You think you are free in it, but you live in the cage. So there is no way out. So there is a third, when people are utterly desperate and utterly unhappy with both traditional, in North Korean case, Japanese imperial order, and second, the rational power of a liberal order kind, and you need a third power. That is charismatic power. Is person who is rhetorically brilliant, orator, and who performs incredible art of politics, and so all, it's a, it's a leader whose power is not based on institutional management on daily basis, but it is captivating, mystifying, personalized power that you represent. Okay, something like a brilliant. I just finished a book on, um, you know, Billy Graham on the global evangelical movements. For some reasons, you know, it's to do with the Cold War. I cannot show you. I'm not doing anything else. But <clears throat> it's someone like Billy Graham. You know, it's it's totally. Charismatic. I, I never, I never been in Billy Graham, you know. But Billy Graham technique is all coming from this country. The American evangelicalism comes from this country. The the art of captivating everyone comes from this country. It's so good on religious sector. The politicians are less good. And maybe college um, head of chapels are less good these days. But it, the, this country used to be so good in the 18th, particularly in the beginning of 19th century. It transformed the United States, the new world. But anyway, something in, in that line, you need an, a personalized power to which people pay attention and uh, give their trust, so it's a great leader is born. And, but the Weber's thought is, okay, this is, this is known, and, and he could observe in the transformation of Germany from Weimar Republic to further on, and it was happening everywhere in, in Europe as well, for better or for worse, but it, mostly for worse, but it was happening, but he thought, no, have hope, because charismatic power, when the person who exercises the charismatic power is gone, there is no long live the king. It's gone, and it is lost. So the politics either has to go back to traditional or find a way to enter into rational order. So that was Max Weber's hope. I think in reading him once again and times, I think he, what he said about charismatic power 
was not necessarily his theoretical conclusion. It was aspirational conclusion. If there are uh, eminent sociologists, social thinkers sitting here, you may challenge me, but that's how I feel when I read his work, original work, partly in German. That's what I feel that he was, uh, that's what he was trying to say, that have hope. And this having hope is important. When people start having that hope, okay, you've done your job, you've done your party, and you're gone, and that's done with, we do something else. Have hope for that. That was Weber's message in my reading. But North Korea, since 1970s, and, it's, and most evidently from the end of the Cold War, 1990s, has taken, taken as a telos of the life of the state to, to outdo Max Weber, to outdo the conclusion, to break, break free from the conclusion of modern social thought. That it is possible to perpetuate charismatic power beyond the life of that modern charismatic power beholder. So that's how I uh, concluded my earlier work. <clears throat> it's called North Korea, colon, Beyond Charismatic Politics. And I did the same as Weber did. I had no idea whether you can go beyond. There are so many, against, so many odds against it. But the, it's a, it was a moral message. It has to go beyond. Stop it. And it has to go beyond. Go beyond it. Find something else. If you don't like traditional power, no way. We don't like traditional power either. If you, if you find the rational power is too constricting, we all feel constricted. Let's, let's collaborate. Let's get together and do something else. That's the only way, right? Jointly with every, every other nation, every other people. What else there is? So there was my, um, mind you, I just maybe things are becoming too serious. I think it was okay that book, it's a kind of, it's, uh, I'm not a North Korea expert. I, um, it's not my main field, but it's toward the end of con finishing the conclusion. I kept having dream of uh, North Korea. Secondly, the Kim Jong Il. It happens, you know, when you're in the thick of writing. Dreams are important, and I had three dreams. First, he came really um, with a kind of. Um, you know, a smile that was not a smile. Um, and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't make out what this smile of this leader was doing in my dream. Anyway, the, my waking up, my feeling was that the, in the dream, at least, this, uh, I was writing about here with this uh, form of politics in North Korea, and this gentleman was sneezing at me that you, you're not going to get that. No, no way. A second dream was he looked expressionless, you know, a bit more serious than the first. And third one, he looked a bit sad and a bit depressed in my, in my impression. So I thought waking up, I've done it. The power pen is not more, but as strong as the power of the gun. Can be, at least. So I felt good, and I said yes to my editor. And uh, so legacy politics is called, and this, I'll skip this part, and back to military first politics, based on North Korea's theoretical assessment of the collapse of Soviet empire and its declaration of its age old you know, kind of determination to be 
independent from the power of China. I mean, uh, among other things, uh, created this amazing political form called military first politics. So the, the, the social economy, if it suffers, it, is, it suffers for good and ultimate reason, which is the defense of North Korean revolution, which is anchored in the power of the army. Right? And, then, <clears throat> and now it is, we, uh, after it declared that we are nuclear armed state, and we are waiting for your recognition, and then that the, the ultimate symbol of military power, military first politics, is ICBM. So it is very turbulent time. And again, we can <clears throat> apply, we may apply what I said earlier, that if you are so resiliently, so radically against imperial or colonial politics, somehow you end up with the political form for which for some people, no matter how hard they try, are obliged to find similarity, some similarity with imperial politics. And the same goes to military first politics. And this is a long story, but United States during the Korean War seriously contemplated bombing North Korea and the southern tip of northeast part of China with a nuclear bomb to prevent the People's Volunteer Army further rushing in, right? So it, if you are so stubbornly against certain things, right, or American military power, somehow you become, uh, in certain elements, quite close to it. And this is also, this also has relevance that if you are close to it, you become on a par in authority and power to the head of the state in the most powerful state of the contemporary world. So there are several things going on. So <clears throat> I'll end uh, my main talk with that. If you bear with me for three to four minutes, I will um, end with a small reflection on here and now the time we leave. Okay. So the North Korea of today is not the same place as the North Korea of yesterday. The formal state system remains largely unchanged, especially the centrality of the paramount charismatic leadership. Although there has been some change recently since now is the third generation, I didn't go into that at all, but I was specifically advised by, um, I wouldn't name who, but it's kind of state authority, not to get into third generation leadership, which uh, I, uh, which I faithfully follow. And <clears throat> so since third generation leadership took power in 2011, especially in the claims the sublimation of a decade-long um, military first politics, military first socialism in the ICBM and in the claim for nuclear armed statehood. Changes are found rather in the relationship between the state and society. And North Korean society today can no longer depend on the state for its physical survival. And the state has long support, stopped being the paternalistic guarantor of its citizens' everyday life, economic well-being, despite the fact that in the rhetorical sphere, it has never been anything short of it throughout its 70 years of existence. Important changes are also notable in the international environment. The so-called strategic competition between the United States and China has been made more remarkable in recent days and explicit in, in East Asia and beyond 
And this has recently taken on an increasingly military character in addition to the largely economic and technological aspect in previous decades. This, this is bound to bring changes to North Korea-China relations. It did already as the texture of North Korea's military first politics defined, as I said early on, in part, in distinction to China's economy first, socialism. And since Russia's invasion of Ukraine a year ago already, Pyongyang has been making active diplomatic gestures towards Moscow with strong rhetorical support for the latter, and not only a rhetorical support, which I'm not going to mention, which is a delicate subject. Um, and so observers speculate that in these utterly precarious times, Pyongyang may feel less isolated than before. You know, in, before, after the end of the Cold War, and uh, feel that it can find a niche and new role in the emerging and uh, radicalizing great power politics. Will North Korea still be able to claim the bright shining status of the soul and solitary Venga revolutionary power? This, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get into. So the, the North Korean social science literature is readable it's uh, the, the, the tell us the specifics, I mean, the purpose of military first politics. I mentioned briefly it, North Korea's analysis of the breakdown of Soviet power, it's the alienation of its army from the party, and so North Korea's determination to prevent this from happening in the post-Cold War world, and in in extension, uh, from early 2000s, North Korea has, North Korean social science literature has somewhat astonishingly to our ears has claimed that with, with the end of Soviet power, the world has a new bipolar political system which consists of the most powerful nation state in the world in the 20th century, which is the United States, and on the other side is the powerful, singular, solitary, solitary revolutionary power, which is North Korea. So the leader of this vanguard Solitary revolutionary power is, again, not a national leader, it's a global leader. It's solitary, alone, no friends, but nevertheless, it's a global leader. Right. So, evidence suggests that Pyongyang is toning down um, uh, this rhetoric of solitude. Um, <clears throat> the rhetoric of a soul in a solitary uh, revolutionary polity that holds high the flag, the proud flag of socialism, revolutionary socialism, somewhat, highlighting instead the virtue of friendship with China and Russia on the front of international solidarity against American power. That's very recent phenomenon. The problem is, however, that none of this can make North Korea's Solitude, uh, not isolation, solitude, a thing of the past. North Korea's isolationism relates closely to the former politics, the leadership of particularly the succession of power that it has sustained. To be a true and truly meaningful charismatic leader, the leader must not be merely the leader of the nation, but also of the world. This was the case with the country's founding leader, and uh, it is equally the case with his hereditary successor and new keeper of the founding leader's legacy. One sentence. 
I look forward to learning how North Korea's dedicated political theories will resolve this contradiction, not an easy one at all, and formulate a new argument, the contradiction between a being a weak and marginal actor in the great power politics on the one hand, and on the other, the imperative of its own leader, not those of great power, being the most bright, shining, singularly majestic player in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Kwon, for what I have to say was a very charismatic performance. Um, and now I'm joined by uh, Dr. Tamsin Samuels, a research fellow at Darwin and in the Department of Genetics, to briefly reflect on your lecture, please. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to start, of course, by adding my thanks to Professor Kwon for presenting this really interesting lecture and giving us some insight um, into the political system of North Korea. I think many of us have a natural fascination with North Korean society, perhaps due to its isolation, as somewhere secretive, mysterious, and for most of us, impossible to visit. Professor Kwon turned the tables to help us understand how North Korea sees itself and its own place in global politics. We learned that North Korea is not unique in its political structure as a post-colonial nation, and that the emergence of a charismatic leader was common during such times of upheaval as North Korea experienced. However, most charismatic leaders see a dramatic rise and then fall. So what makes North Korea so fascinating is the longevity of this political system and how it has been passed through generations now to its third leader. We have understood that North Korea's isolation was imposed upon it after the Cold War as it shifted to defend its political sovereignty, putting its military first. It has aimed to be a leader amongst post-colonial developing nations and sees itself as the opposition power needed by the world to confront the dominance of the United States. From our perspective, the reality seems quite different, and North Korea has become more and more isolated, even from its closest allies, China and Russia, as their priorities haven't been aligned. Professor Kwong concludes by suggesting that today's shifting politics with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the deteriorating relationship between China and the US may provide opportunity for North Korea to find a new and less isolated role in global politics. So all that remains is for me to thank you again for presenting this lecture and giving us all a new perspective on the isolation of North Korea. Thank you very much, Tamsin. Um, if you're very quick on your way out, uh, you can, of course, buy the book of all the um, essays uh, relating to this year's lectures. Do please join us again next week for the last in our eight lectures uh, being delivered by Dr. Amrita Nalikar on the isolation, isolation in international relations. Finally, please join me once again in thanking uh, Professor Kwong. <laughs>